Well, praise the Lord. Let's open up with a prayer as we uh, begin tonight. We're going to look at Leviticus and the law tonight. Um, Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus and we thank you for who you are and what you do and what you're about to do. We ask for your guidance by your Holy Spirit as you bring forth your word and as you teach us and train us up in the way in which we should go. We thank you for all that you want to show us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Tonight as we begin, I want to uh, uh, just make introduction of two things here that we've talked about in the last one. This is a strong concordance. And every time we make reference to any numbers, uh, any numbers we'll talk about will be in Strong's Concordance, which is a complete dictionary of every single word that you can find in the Bible. And I want to show you another book tonight as well. This Bible is called the Interlinear Bible. And in this Bible, it is also every single word that is in the Bible in its original language is listed. So the whole Bible in the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. Underneath the Hebrew writing is an, is an English translation, and above the Hebrew word is the Strong's number. So every time we look at something, uh, and we look at um, the passages in Leviticus, for instance, some of the ways that we know that some words are not the same as some other words, you, we don't have to look every single word up in Strong's, but we can simply just look right at the passage and read it and see for ourselves what that word is, and the number is right there coded to Strong's and then we can go back to Strong's and see what that is. This is an interlinear Bible is what it's called, Hebrew, Greek, and English. So um, I've used both of those as we looked into Leviticus and uh, so that's, so that's all how we discover some of the things that we've discovered and I want you to know that so that uh, you don't think I'm just making this stuff up or pulling it out of the top of my head or anything. Okay, in Leviticus, um, we come across a passage that people use immediately to condemn homosexuals and there are two passages, they're almost identical. Uh, they're found in Leviticus chapter 18 and also Leviticus chapter 20. And Leviticus, however, is the law. It's the Old Testament Jewish law that was given to the nation of Israel and uh, Leviticus is not the only place that the law is found. The law is also found in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means the second telling, the second time the law was told, and uh, Exodus also had some fragments of the law. So when you look at the Jewish law in particular, uh, there are many, many places that the law is listed, but Leviticus is, is, is the telling of the law. If we look at just these two passages, we're going to look at a Leviticus 18.22. I'm going to look at that one first. I'll just read it out of the King James Bible, and then I'll read it, the uh, passage in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. We'll look at more in detail the passage in 2013, although they're identical because there's more wording and more uh, stated in the chapter 20 passage. In Leviticus 18, verse 22, it says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. I'll just stop with that. We'll go to chapter 20, verse 13. If a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. Well, if we believe that's what it says and that's how it is, well then every time we find a, a, a man who has ever gone to bed with another man, the way that he would have gone to bed with a woman, only one thing we can do, kill him. Right? That's what the Bible says, and so that's what we should do. And there are people that take that attitude, and there are people who think, well, that's it. That's all there is to it. If, in fact, Leviticus 20 was saying that if a man went to bed with a man, you ought to kill him. Uh, if it was saying that, then we would still not be able to kill him, because we would need to understand the purpose and the intent of the law. But we'll discover later tonight that it's not saying that at all. But just for people who would just read their King James Bible, look at that and say, well, it says right here, men shouldn't lie with men and that's all there is to it, then you need to understand what the law is all about. Because it might be a little hard to get them to look at an interlinear Bible and a strong concordance and to see what the Bible is really saying in terms of all those verses and all those words that are listed there. But if you had nothing else to go on, you need to understand the law. 
So that's why tonight we're calling this looking at Leviticus and the law, the entire law, what the law is all about. We have to look at the New Testament concept of the law if we're going to understand the law. So we look at 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. That will give us a little bit of insight into uh, how Christians perceive the law. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 and that says not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves but our sufficiency is of God who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter kills but the spirit gives life so if we're gonna look at the law and we're gonna try to get everybody to live by the letter of the law we find that the letter of the law brings death but the spirit gives life so in order to understand the law you need to understand the spirit in which it is written and what is the intent of the law and what is God trying to say to the people of God when God gave the law uh, in Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 uh, this is an important concept also because these Galatian believers uh, had been were Gentiles to begin with and then Judaizers came along and tried to make them then follow the law even though they were already born again spirit-filled believers Judaizers came along and said well you really still can't be a Christian even though you're born again spirit-filled believer you still need to follow the Jewish rituals and the laws of Moses and so Paul addresses that situation by saying, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? In other words, if you start off how did you receive the Holy Spirit, Paul's asking. Did you receive it because you followed all of the rituals and all of the laws and because you finally attained to goodness, God gave you the Holy Spirit? Or was it simply by faith you received the Holy Spirit? And then having received the Holy Spirit by faith, are you then going to be perfected by going back into the ancient traditions and laws and rituals? Or are you going to be perfected by continuing on in faith with the Holy Spirit? So uh, Paul's telling them, if you want to go back to the law, you're going to be, uh, you're really fools, in fact, he says. And then the book of James, they tell us a little bit more about the law. James chapter 2, verse 10. And this is, if you didn't remember any other scriptures about the law, this is the one to remember. James chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, if anybody keeps the the whole law, all of it, everything in Exodus, everything in Deuteronomy, everything in Leviticus, keeps all of that law, and yet offends in one point. He is guilty of all of it. So if a person were to condemn a gay person, a gay male, because he had had sex with a, another man, according to Leviticus, condemn him for that purpose, and, uh, and yet they themselves had not kept all of the law, they are guilty of that same sin in Leviticus. If you, don't, if you keep all of it and yet miss it in one little tiny iota, you're guilty of everything in there. Guilty of murder, guilty of adultery, guilty of everything that uh, is convicting in the law. So James makes a pretty clear statement. So if somebody wants you to live by the law, then they themselves must be living by the law. And we discover through the Gospels, of course, that nobody ever did. Nobody ever could. In fact, that's why we all need a Savior. The purpose of the law is to show us our deep need for a Savior. Because mankind has always said, well, I'll just, if I'm, just, I'm a good person. And I can just, I can do it on my own. I don't need God. I don't need the cross. I can do it. So we look at Romans 3. And we're going to see uh, just how desperately we need a Savior to save us from the law. Romans 3, chapter 3, verse 10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. So that means everybody ends up being guilty under the entire law. All of us. 
There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that does good. No, not one. It doesn't matter how much you think you've done good. The word says, based on the standard of the law, there's not one that has done good. Nobody. In fact, if you pick up with verse 19 in the same chapter, and verse 20, it says, Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. In other words, everybody's mouth is stopped if they try to... Uh, try to say, well, I'm good enough, and you look at the law, and you see everybody's mouth is stopped, and we find out there's not one that made it. Not one of us was good enough if we were going to meet it by God's standard. Verse 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So since James said, if you've missed one point, you've missed all of it, Romans 3.23 shows us that we've all missed something, and having missed something, we've all missed it. Every human being has missed it. So meeting the criteria of the law to begin with is not the way to heaven. So what's in the law is not what we're going to live by. What's in the law is simply what is there to show us how desperately we need Jesus. That's the point of the law. Now we look at Matthew 7 and that says, verse 1 to 2, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you mete out, it will be measured to you again. So if someone wants to judge someone based on the law, they themselves become accountable to that very same law. And we know already that if they've missed one point in the law, then they're held accountable for the very thing they're judging someone for because they've missed the whole law. You with me so far? Okay. Now, let's look at the law. Some of the things that people are expected to live by. I mean, if you're going to say, well, you know, you ought to live by the law because you can't just simply pull out Leviticus 18 or Leviticus 20 and say, well, look right here, God hates homosexuals. Well, you just can't do that. You have to look at the whole law. And if you want to look at the whole law, let's look at some of the things that are in the law and see if, how well do people measure up. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 20, it says that if you ever lend out any money, you better not charge interest. In uh, Deuteronomy 24, verse 5, it says, if you get married, you're not allowed to go to work for a full year. Now, how would your paycheck like that? So anyone who wants to condemn somebody, ask them, are they married? If they're married, did they stay home from work for a full year? If they didn't, then they're guilty of the whole law, all of it. Because the law said, you marry a new wife, you're not allowed to go to war, nor are you allowed to go to work. You have to stay home for a whole year. If they didn't do it, sorry, they've missed the whole thing. In Leviticus uh, chapter 19, verse 14, deaf person makes you angry. You ever say anything mean against the deaf person, you've missed the whole law. If a uh, uh, Leviticus 19, 17, you ever get really angry at your brother, a uh, blood relative, and you just hate them. You're in big trouble. You've missed the law. You have missed the law. And you're guilty of all of it. You're guilty of all of it. In Leviticus 19.19, 19, it says that if a person has a piece of ground, and on that piece of ground they plant two things, they're guilty. Because you're only allowed to put one kind of seed on a piece of property. So if you've planted green peppers and tomatoes, you're guilty. If you have uh, put two kinds of grass on your lawn, guilty. So Leviticus 19.19 19 does not cut you any slack. You're not allowed to put two kinds of seeds or mingle two kinds of seeds together on the same piece of property. In Le Deuteronomy 22, verse 11, it says that if you're wearing a piece of cloth and it's not purebred, one fabric but in fact is a blend or a mixture of anything, then you are guilty of the law. So check your label. If it's not 100% cotton, or if it's not 100% linen, or 100% wool, but in fact is a polyester blend or anything else, or if you have ever done that in your lifetime, you are guilty of the law. 
for breaking the law. If, um, if Deuteronomy 23 says, if a man has been hurt in his private area, he is never, ever, ever allowed to enter the congregation, ever. So who's at the doors of all these churches checking to find out if that's so? Because if they let him in, they are guilty of breaking the whole law. The whole law. In Deuteronomy 23, 27, if a man shaves, it's broken the law. Broken the law. In Deuteronomy 23, 32, you are commanded to honor your elders at all times. So if you see an aged woman or an aged man and you get a little snippy with them, you've broken the law. If uh, Deuteronomy t chapter 20 verse 9 uh, says that if you curse your parents, you have just incurred the death penalty. So you ever got mad or angry at your parents and said something under your breath? By the law, you should have been put to death. Now, why aren't we putting people to death who curse their parents? But the law requires it, you see. And so, uh, yet if they've ever been mad at their parents, ever, ever been angry and said anything against them, they're guilty of the whole law. Of course, uh, chapter 20 of Deuteronomy, verse 10 says that if they've ever committed adultery, death penalty. It's the only thing they've got, both of them. And uh, yet, we look at the New Testament and we see that someone was caught in adultery in the very act in John chapter 8 verses 3 to 7 and Jesus response to the woman caught in adultery was not that's right it's in the law of Moses we gotta kill this woman and kill the man too no his act was alright the first one of you who has never ever sinned now look at the law the first one who's never sinned you can cast the first stone well of course there is none righteous there is none holy. There's none who can stand before God and say, I've never done any of these things. Because we only just look at it, just, a, uh, just a few little scatterings, just a little touching of some of the things in the law. We haven't really got into the depth of the law and all the things that the law says and all the little innuendos and all the little tiny things that, you know, if you just do this or just do that or break the Sabbath laws or any of the other kinds of dietary laws. We haven't got into any of those things. And so you can see that when Jesus had the woman uh, who had been caught in adultery, he said simply, where are your accusers? And she said, I don't have any. He said, I guess not. And so he just told her simply, don't go, go now and don't sin anymore. In uh, Deuteronomy 25, 22, chapter, or 22, verse 5, that tells us that if a woman is married and she uh, just uh, the doorbell rings and she grabs her husband's flannel shirt to go in through the door, she's guilty under the law. Likewise, if uh, the husband grabs his wife high heels and he runs to answer the door, he's guilty under the law also. Because a woman is never to wear men's clothing and a man is never to wear women's clothing under any circumstances. You're guilty under the law. Ministers in uh, chapter 21 of Deuteronomy, interestingly enough, uh, chapter 21 of uh, Deuteronomy, and that is uh, verses 17 to 21, and I'm going to read some of these things because, you know, congregations need to, they can judge their ministers on this, on this one alone. Uh, and if their ministers don't meet the code here, then they are imperfect ministers and they can't be ministers in God's house. So verse 17 says, uh, Oh, I think I'm, actually, I think I'm probably going to be in Leviticus is what I do think. Yeah, I think I'm supposed to be Leviticus here. Leviticus chapter 17. And uh, I'm sorry, get these right. Leviticus 21 verse 17. Thank you. Got it, finally. All right. Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, any blemish, a pimple, needing to wear glasses, any blemish. Let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach 
a blind man or a lame or he that has a flat nose. We can't let any flat nose ministers into the house of God. Or anything superfluous. Or a man that's broken footed or broken handed or crookbacked, or dwarf, or he that hath a blemish in his eye. So if he wears glasses, can't be the minister. Or uh, scurvy, or scab, or hath his stones broken. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest shall come near to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He has a blemish. He shall not come near to offer the bread of God. And so you see that uh, there's condemnation. You have to judge your minister and look and see, now is there anything wrong with you anywhere? And who's going to be the one who's going to sit there and look as the minister uh, gets robed up in the vestments and to see, you know, now, do you got anything wrong here? We've got to make sure, you know, you've got a pimple, you've got a blemish anywhere. Out, you can't do it today. Forget it. Um, in, um, in Leviticus 15, the woman who is uh, having her menstrual period, for seven days she's unclean. And there's all kinds of laws about that. And then she has to bring an offering of a turtle dove and offer a sacrifice of a turtle up. Every month she's got to do this. And she's ritually unclean if uh, she doesn't do that. She's broken the law if she doesn't meet the prescribed requirements for this. In, um, so you see, it doesn't take very much effort to discover that nobody is guilt-free. Absolutely nobody. So you don't need a passage like Leviticus 18.22 or 20 verse 13 to speak specifically single out gay people and say they're all guilty and God hates them. Well, the fact of the matter is everybody's guilty. You don't need a passage. I mean, if you've ever worn fabric that has got more than one kind of polyester blend or any synthetic thing, or if you've ever planted a garden or then put more than one thing in that garden, you're guilty. Everybody's guilty. Everybody, in fact, is guilty. There's none that's righteous. So you don't need a law. And it, it is a curiosity to me that some people will single out this and say, here's the sin God hates. Well, what about all these other things? Because James says, you miss one thing, you've missed all of it. And you are guilty of all of it, not just one thing. So you're guilty of being a minister with a scab, even though you've never been a minister, because you're guilty of the whole law. All of it. You're guilty of charging interest to your relatives. You're guilty for having married somebody, even if you're single, and not, and not stayed at home for a year because you've broken the whole law. There's not a, it's not a pass-fail. By 50%, you did pretty good. It is simply you missed one thing, you've missed it all. That's how it operates. So now we look at Leviticus 18.22. And that says... If a man, or it doesn't even say a man in this one, it says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. I want to pick up on this word abomination here, and also reading again from Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They surely shall be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. What does the word abomination mean? Now, I know what you probably think it means in English. But you see, in fact, you've got to tell me what does it mean in Hebrew. Because what it means in Hebrew is what is really written there. Not what you think it means in English in, 19, in the 1900s and in the 20th century. But what did it mean when it was written in Hebrew? The word abomination would be number 8441 in Strong's and that word is the word toeba. Toeba means idolatry. It doesn't mean disgusting, it means idolatry. It means things which belong to the worship of idols or the idol itself. Now, so when we look at this particular passage, it says, first of all, uh, they have committed an abomination. What it is literally saying is they have committed idolatry. Now, why is it that they have committed idolatry? You would think maybe it would say they've committed a lustful act 
or maybe they've committed uh, an unlawful act. But it doesn't. It is saying they've committed idolatry. Why did they commit idolatry? Why does the Word of God single out this behavior and say, this is idolatry? The reason is, both in both those chapters, chapter 18 and chapter 20, they go on to say, look at the chapter 18, verse 24. Defile not yourselves in any of these things, any of the things that you've just read about, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. Verse 27, for all these abominations or all these idolatries have the men of the land done which were before you, the land is defiled. Look at chapter 20, verse 23. And you will not walk in the manners of the nations which I cast out before you, for they have committed all these things, therefore I abhor them. In other words, God's covenant and God's law in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Exodus are dealing with God's covenant people. And this covenant people are now supposed to be the people on earth who have a covenant walk with Yahweh, with God Almighty, with Jehovah. And so they're not supposed to do the things that the idolatrous heathen nations had been doing. And he's saying, here's what they did. Don't do what they did because it's idolatry. The reason it's idolatry, first of all, is we know something about the cultic practices of the nations that were thrown out. One of the things is they used to practice, their idolatrous practices used to involve fertility cults. They would believe in their worship services or their worship of fertility gods and goddesses that if uh, the high priest of their religion, whether their god was Chemosh or Molech or uh, Dagon, if their high priest or their high priestess would have sex with you, that that was in fact a way to pass on your blessing through the priest to that goddess or to that God and in so doing ensure the fertility of your ground, your crops, uh, your, your spouse, your children so that since this was an agricultural society having your ground be fertile and your crops be fertile or your cattle be fertile and your sheep be fertile was very, very important and that was a part of their religious ceremony. So God comes along and says, if you do these things, you're doing the same idolatrous things that they did and don't do this because it is idolatry. In other words, it's a part of their worship. It's a part of what they used to do for worship. And so he's saying, you're supposed to worship me, not their Molech and Chemosh and Dagon. You worship me. And involved in those kinds of worships are these kinds of practices. Now, that's one thing we know. So he says, the nations which I cast out before you have committed all these things. They've done these things. But over the last few years, if I've studied these passages even more, there's something that isn't as obvious if you just read it in English. But there is something that's very obvious when you read it in Hebrew. Because in Hebrew, it does not say what you think it might say. It's not talking about Look at this word up here with me, Leviticus 20, 13, because I just broke it down for us into the Strong's words, the words that are used in Strong's Concordance. It says, and a man, 376, who lies with mankind, 2145, as one lies with a woman, 802, both of them have committed to Ebha idolatry. Now you would think that if God was trying to make a case about homosexual behavior, that God would have talked about a man with a man. And if God was talking about a man with a man or a woman with a woman, he would have used the same word because it would have been an equal basis if a man is with a man. But it, you see, based on the numbering in Strong's, that's not the case. It would have had to have said, if a man, 376, who lies with a man, 376, as one lies with a woman, 802, then they have committed 
something other than idolatry, something other than 8441, then God could have said that's wrong or something, or that's lust, or whatever God would have wanted to have said. The word 802, the word for woman, is an identical comparable word to the word 376. It's the feminine, an irregular plural, so it gets translated as woman, a, a feminine version of 376. 376 is the word ish, and it simply means a man, just general, just in general, a mortal, a male human being. That's all it means. The word 802 means an identical thing in a female context. It means each and every woman, any woman. It doesn't specify who she is, anything about her. It doesn't make any difference who she is. In fact, the consequences of who she is is of no consequence. We don't care who she is. We don't need to know her name. She's the same word. It's the same word used for a harlot. In other words, the way that you behave toward a harlot is the way this is talking about because you don't care what the harlot's name is. You don't care what her mama and her daddy's last name is or what town she came from or, you know, who's her brother and her sister or where did she go to school or what she like, is she a good cook? You don't care anything about her. Just each and every woman, the way you would treat a woman in general and if a man, just in general, we don't care who he is. Now all of a sudden, it does not say if a man lies with a man, it says if he lies with Zakar. 2145. Now this word Zakar is a very specific deliberate word and this word means to be remembered. It isn't the word man, it's the word to be remembered. In fact many places in the Bible it is translated as a remembrance. You know God remembered us or God God remembered our situation and God had mercy or some different situations many times, many, many times it's translated and you can see that it talks about remembering things, to be remembered because re it is an important thing, very important thing. In other words, you're not to lie with this person to be remembered, somebody very important. The way that you would lie with a common harlot or prostitute. Now there is a difference in the way that you would lie with somebody who you better remember who they are because this is important. We're talking about the President of the United States. The way that you would lie with any woman, a harlot, any common woman, anybody you do not need to know anything about her because it is toebha idolatry. In this idolatrous worship, you don't care who the priest is or the name of the priest. All you care about is that your fertility of whatever it is that you want to be fertile is going to be guaranteed. All you care about is that the religious ritual is taken care of. You don't need to know the priest or the priestess's name. You don't care who their family is. You don't care what uh, if you've got their phone number so that you can call them up again sometime. You don't care who they are. All you care about is the worship's experience is over. Now you can go home in peace knowing that your cattle will reproduce. That's all you care about. But the Lord has shown me something over the last two years that I had never seen before. There's something even more involved in this word zakar. This word zakar is somebody very, very important. We're looking at kings of nations. We're looking at rulers over peoples. Somebody who ought to be, you better remember their name. You just don't come in their presence and, and uh, you know, oh, what's your name again? You're talking to Bill Clinton. You're talking to Ronald Reagan. You're talking to someone that you ought to know who in the world you're talking to. Queen Elizabeth. Somebody to be remembered. Somebody who, it ought to make a difference to you that you've just shook their hand. That's who we're talking about, not your average Joe, ish, man, 376. Doesn't matter who he is, we don't care, doesn't make, just one of many. Zakar is not one of many. Somebody very unique, very special, very important. And so, 
we discover that one of the practices of the idolatrous heathen nations that surrounded Israel and of which Israel uh, took their property as they went to war against them, when they would go to war against another king on another country, if they won that battle, one of the ways that they would prove that they were stronger, mightier, and that their God, small g, was bigger and mightier and more important than your God, small g, was to humiliate the king, Zakar, someone to be remembered. And what they would do to that king is to humiliate him and treat him like a harlot. They would lie with him. Now, I didn't put down, uh, well, it is, it's down there, 7901. Lie with him as one lies with a woman. We looked at that word lies last week. That's the word that uh, not only means to lie down, uh, it is also the word that means to ravish or to rape, to seize and carry away by force. It's a very violent kind of word. So if a man has a violent act against in a sexual connotation, somebody who's very important and ought to be remembered and treated with dignity and treated with respect, the way they would ravish and pillage a town and rape all the women, then that is in fact idolatry, meaning it is a part of their worship because they credit their God for having that victory over this God who was defeated. It's idolatry because in their concept and their way of thinking, their God is bigger than your God. And because their God is stronger and their God is with them, they're able to ravish and, and uh, pillage and burn and loot and show you and take the king and take the king and humiliate the king rather than honor and respect the king. And God says, this is abomination. Don't do this because this is something I will not honor. I will not honor. In fact, there is an example of this concern with Saul. When Saul was defeated at the hands of the Philistines. And we look in the last chapter of 1 Samuel... And we see that Saul is defeated in war. And here's what Saul says. I'll read about Saul's death here, just the whole chapter. Chapter 31, 1 Samuel. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him. And he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not because he was afraid, sore afraid. Therefore, Saul took a sword and fell upon it. Saul would rather die by committing suicide than be abused, ravaged, uh, raped, and treated like a prostitute at the hands of the uncircumcised Philistines. He goes on to say, And when the armor bearers saw that Saul was dead, and he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him, so Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor-bearer, and all his men that same day together. If you don't know who Saul is, Saul was the king of Israel, was the king of God's people. And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley, and they that were on the other side of the Jordan, saw that the men of Israel fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt therein. And it came to pass on the morrow, the next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his three sons fa fallen in Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols. To go from temple to temple to temple to temple with the head of Saul. To say, look God, small g, 
God of the Philistines, look what you did. Here's our sacrifice to you and among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth is a specific goddess, fertility goddess, that uh, uh, was either, depending on which religion, which country, uh, Ashtaroth either was the wife of Baal or the mother of Baal. And they fastened his body to the wall in this temple, a sacrifice to this god, this goddess, Ashtaroth. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, a town in Israel, heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul. See, he wasn't treated as somebody to be remembered. He was being treated as dirt. And the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. So you see, the Philistines had no intentions of taking someone's zakar to be remembered, someone important, and treating them with any dignity. And Saul knew that. In fact, Saul said, please, please kill me so that I don't fall into the abuse that they're going to give me when they find me, even though there's just a little bit of life in me. They wouldn't bandage his wounds and, you know, they would continue to abuse him so much that he feared of it. In fact, the word that he says, lest they abuse me, in 1 Samuel 31, 4, is in Strong's number 5953. And you find this same word, abuse, when we looked last week in Judges chapter 19, when they took the man's wife, his concubine, and abused her all night long until she was found dead on the steps in the morning. And so that's the word Saul is saying, you know, save me from these people unless they do this to me all night long. So uh, the, uh, the situation in Leviticus chapter 20 is not talking about two gay men who have fallen in love and set up house and and are, are having a mutuality and a love relationship and a love respect for one another. It's talking about a situation like in this modern age, like prison rape. Like a situation where one gang is just doing something to humiliate someone else, just to prove something, to prove they're bigger, they're badder, they're more powerful. And uh, in fact, it is in this Leviticus 18 passage, chapter 18, verse 21, right before verse 22 that says, you shall not lie with mankind as with womankind. The, the verse right before that says, and thou shalt not let any of thy seed or semen pass through the fire to Molech. Molech is a god, a small god, G. You shall not, in other words, have sex with their high priest or their high priestess thinking that their thinking was that when you had sex with that god that priest or priestess the seed passed right on to that god so you shall not um, let any of your seed pass through the fire to molech neither shall you profane the name of thy god i am the lord thou shalt not lie with mankind thou shalt not lie with zakar someone to be remembered the way you would lie with a prostitute. It is idolatry because it's all wrapped up in idolatry. All these things, verse 24 says, all these abominations have the men of the land done which were before you and the land is defiled. So you see when we look at Leviticus, although and the law, uh, there's really nothing else in Leviticus. There's nothing else. There's no other passages for us to look at and say, well, what about this one? We've looked at them all. There's only those two. And they both say the same thing. They're both talking about zakar, to be remembered. And so, uh, you know, what does that say to you today? Well, we're not in that situation. I don't think nations, civilized nations, don't usually treat their captives that way anymore. But they, they can. Some have. Some do. But when, when uh, Russia or uh, the United States goes to war against 
another nation. We don't treat our captives that way. We usually get them to sign a treaty or get them to sign something. We act a little differently than they acted in that day, but you still see in this, in this world today people who still behave this way. They take the, the one who you know, should be the head of that nation and, and rather than give them uh, opportunity to still have dignity and to still have honor, they just humiliate them and embarrass them and, and uh, in fact rape them and, and kill them. And then in this case they took the body of Saul and just stuck it up in the, in the temple. Absolutely no dignity whatsoever. God says that is abomination. That is idolatry. So that's all I have on Leviticus because that's all there is. Next week we'll look at a whole other issue. We're going to look at something in the New Testament. Two scriptures, one in 1 Timothy and one in 1 Corinthians and we're going to ask ourselves this question, who are these folks anyway? So we need to know. Would you pray with me please? Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the truth of your word. And I ask you to let your word settle in our heart and I ask you to let us see that regardless of what is being talked about in Leviticus, there isn't one that's righteous and we all need a savior. We all need Jesus Christ. And I thank you that you so loved us, that you redeemed us from the law and that you gave us the blessings instead. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And he said, take hold of my covenant and I will be your God. Take hold of my covenant and with the angels trod. If you will keep my Sabbath and please me in your ways, I'll be your God and add unto you many, many days. Take hold of my covenant and